Meanwhile, at the Hall of Cage. This is my snakeskin jacket, and for me, it's a symbol of my individuality and belief in personal freedom. Oh God, not the bees. Killing me won't bring back your goddamn honey. What do you think I'm gonna do? I'm gonna save the fucking day. How absurd. Why couldn't you put the bunny back in the box? How absurd. I'm gonna steal the Declaration of Independence. How absurd. How, in the name of Zeus's butthole, did you get out of your cell? How absurd. What's in the bag? A shark or something? How absurd. Well, I think you better pull the trigger, because I don't give a fuck. How absurd. I never disrobe before gunplay. How absurd. This spot on this mic stand is just getting better and better. Yeah. Remember the times when I used to have like a stand in between my nuts? Yeah, no, that was fun. No, it wasn't fun. I mean, it was funny for me. No. And all the times I had to sit on a guitar amp while we were recording. That only happened like three times to us. Oh, only? Uh, Tell that to my ass cheeks. I mean, I will. Just turn around. It only happened like three times to us. Fuck off! <laughs> Full Ace Ventura. I love it. <laughs> did the mic pick up my asshole? I, I think it did, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit, we're recording. Yeah. I, I kind of figured we were. That's why I kept it going. <laughs> See, now I'm, I'm paranoid ever since that one episode where my sniffles were the only thing you could fucking hear. So every time I'm not speaking, I either back it really, the fuck away. It really wasn't as bad as you thought it was. It's because I edited the fuck out of it. Like, the mm. first run was terrible. Probably so. Yeah, it was awful. It was bad. I finished last, uh, finished, uh, last week's episode, and uh, the attack of the cricket was... Uh, Loud and proud, <laughs> like that son of a bitch. Oh, Those yeah. sons of bitches. Well, I think they're all dead now. Well, there's one right there. Is it a dead one? It's, it is hella. Yeah, dead. it's hella dead. Okay, that one's dead. I mean, I'd rather have crickets than the spiders and the roaches and the I'm sure like fucking dragons that are in Abaddon. 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 I will say, I mean, I hate a spider, but at least they're silent. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it worse. You don't know they're coming until it's all like you didn't see arachnophobia as a kid, but that movie's fucking awful. How do you know I didn't see arachnophobia as a kid? Uh, uh, because you're scared of snakes, not spiders. So you were probably an anaconda guy. You watched John Voight get <laughs> smushed. I sure did though. Oh, there you, go. <laughs> <laughs> you got eaten on. But the that shitter. movie's funny though. It yeah, is arachnophobia. Yeah. That movie fucked me up. Yeah, I have not seen arachnophobia. It's by it, the way. you have don't watch it. Really, you will be just as scared of spiders as you are. Would, would you lack a new phobia starting today? <laughs> I mean, I already like me and s- s- spiders aren't friends, but yeah. at the same token, like at least they're not loud as fuck while we're trying to record. <laughs> well, no, that, that is true. No, to see, the thing is, they, they killed off the screaming spider thousands of years ago because they heard it coming up behind them just like, kill it now. I think David Arquette <laughs> took care of that one back in the 2000s. Oh, Eight-Legged Freaks. Yeah. That was a good movie. Yeah, actually. I mean, it was a terrible movie, but yeah. I enjoyed it thoroughly. It's fun. Anyway. Or it Hello, just, everyone. <laughs> or it, it, it could have been a movie about Scott Steiner and his clones called Eight-Legged Peaks. Ooh, eight. Uh, I mean, freaks would still work yeah, yeah. if you think about yeah, it. Yeah, Genetic it was, freak. Yeah, mm. So you look at me, and then you look at Samoa Joe over here. <laughs> I, lo- I, mean, I love that you love that. That movie so much. would get 144 and a third stars on Letterboxd. <laughs> you, know, you know what? We'll put a pen. In, we'll put a pen in it. Put it on the wheel. The Cajun Crew remakes eight, eight-legged freaks, but with a bunch of Scott Steiners. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Anyway, uh, hello everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Caging Greatness, the <coughs> show where we cough into the mic. We all have lung disease. Uh, I have allergies. Two of us vape slash smoke slash whatever, and then Pat's just there. Howdy. Hi. I can uh, start coughing. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Did I strike a nerve? <laughs> hey, Pat. <laughs> Like, I'm afraid if I try to do it, I'll throw up. 
I can't. I can't make that noise without actually throwing it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's even a baby one. We'll do it as yeah. we've well, proven I've time tried and time it again. once on, on one of the previous episodes and it just didn't work. Yeah. Because I, mean, I can't. I can't commit. Because I just I go, <laughs> but I feel like I'm going to vomit. Yeah. Like, even that wasn't fun just there. Yeah. yeah, it's true. Unfortunately, time and time again, you must commit to that bit. I don't know. I can like, uh, see, he didn't even know it was coming. Yeah, he's, I mean, <laughs> he's used to you doing it though. Like it's funny when you guys do it. I, I, what I, you mean I'm, like? Uh, I'm starting to feel like we only bring it up. It's we're either watching L.A. Beast eat or drink some gross shit, or we're down here recording, and I'm just like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, this is Cajun Greatness. This is Cajun Greatness, <laughs> the show where we make gagging noises and also Thomas Jefferson is a massive prick. Yeah, yes. fuck him. Fuck that guy, seriously. He's, he's a piece of shit. Uh, today, uh, we are talking about the film Pig. One we have been highly anticipating. We've been very excited to check this one out. I know I have. For I mean, sure. I remember there was a time I was checking uh, Fandango every day to see if there's a, a showing coming, and one never came, but, you know, I'm glad we got to see it VOD in the home theater. That's yeah. right, where nope. we, could, we could pause it to pee. Yes, I mean, this, this movie was in three chapters, so that one time I forgot, and I'm sorry again, I had to switch my laundry over. No, that was a hell of a good time to hit that pause. That was great timing. <laughs> uh, uh, as always, I'm joined by uh, our wonderful co-hosts. There's, there's Jonathan. Yeah, and I'm here. There's Pat. It's poor sign Pat. And there's Cannon. I'm barely hanging on, folks. And we are all kind of crying in the club right now. <laughs> um, just to let you, uh, just give you warning, we do always, of course, talk about spoilers. Um, uh, this movie tugged on some heartstrings, and it made me big sad. And I say it that way to cover up the actual real human emotion that I'm currently feeling. So we say funny words. Yes, we, we say, say funny words. Say funny words to deflect uh, how we really feel. Right. And uh, the one time I did that with my therapist, he didn't think that was as uh, charming as I did. That's fair. Oh, he's not very good at his fucking job now, is he? Oh, Lord. I, that was not open, thank Christ. I, I had a therapist <laughs> when I was a young man, but he just said my dad was a crazy one, and then he started selling cars with my dad. Hmm. He was a bad therapist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Point I, being, if I were your therapist... I'd be like, oh, let's go. I like this bit. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to do the normal thing where we go around and we give our ratings and what we talked about. And uh, I, I go ahead and tell you guys, you know that fun joke I do where I say, let me tell you a sad story from my childhood? Yeah. It's not happening. There are too many things that I was reminded it's not happening. Yeah. I'm going to be probably a little more quiet than usual. It got so. pretty real a few times. <laughs> oh, there was so much shit that I didn't need to feel today. <laughs> Uh, so, Jonathan, what did you think of Pig? Oh, Pig. Well, spoiler alert, I don't know. Wow. Fair. I am still processing a lot. Yeah. All I know is I was really fuck. Like, I wasn't crying, but I was real fucking depressed. Yeah. Um, I was really looking forward to this movie. Like, super excited. People calling it, like, the anti-John Wick, which... It is. Yeah, no, that's yeah. Very fair. Fair, yeah. That is absolutely fair. That's true. a good summation. And, yeah. like, you, you know, I, I didn't even, like, watch trailers or anything. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm just here for a good time. Didn't know anything about it. And, and I'm still... I, I just don't n- know. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time someone didn't have their rating right then and there. Right, right, we now, have a right, whole episode to yeah, dissect yeah, like, this bean. Right now, I'm at a very soft <coughs> three and a half. There's a lot of things I really appreciate, a lot of things I really enjoyed. I think this is one of Cage's best performances. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, all all the acting in the movie is phenomenal. Uh, I do feel like, at least for me, there was something not quite clicking, and I don't know what it is. It's just some like weird, intangible thing where I didn't connect to the movie as much as I wanted to. But, like I said, I'm here. This is a very soft three and a half. I am being. I am willing to listen to people, see how they feel. Might change my score. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. That's Imagine fair. John's score as like a silly putty. Just like you just <laughs> stretch it and shape it to 
to the size. And also, right. you could, if you put it on newspaper, you get the reverse. Yeah, what it was, was it, it was, with Silly Putty and newspaper? Uh, I think it was that putty. The putty was slightly sticky, so it would pull up some of the ink on the newspaper because the ink on the newspaper was like just sitting there, as opposed to deeply in the paper, the way like like the new glossy type paper is. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that that's a very non scientific way of saying it. I was an well, easily amused child, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, well, <laughs> as someone who works with newspapers a lot every day, uh, yeah, that shit. <laughs> Comes off real easy. You have stock in Silly Putty. <coughs> Is there yeah. Silly Putty because anywhere if you have in that silly building? Silly Putty at, at your work, John. I would like to have some so I can try and experiment Cannon's tattoos. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm game. Well, because you know, also like comic books used to be made of newsprint. Yeah. And so that that would come up same way. But now these newer the books that have the the glossier paper, it's a lot uh, a lot yeah. higher quality. Silly Putty doesn't work on those. So. Uh, yeah, but the news newsprint's cheap as fuck. So. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, honestly, it might not have been the best. Idea. We couldn't have known, but this might not be the best movie for us to just immediately watch and then come down here and start talking. Like this is yeah, this is one of those movies that needs a little bit of processing. Uh, uh, but um, but you we, know, we can use this podcast. To yeah, we'll process- like we're already here. We're, we're thinking live. We're in the moment. So yeah. we're, we're pro- th- think of this movie as group therapy for the movie we just watched. Think yeah. of this podcast as group therapy. It's like it's like we're doing a Bill Riley, Bill O'Reilly, but the part where he said, fuck it, we'll do it live, not the part where he was a sociopathic monster who ruined every life in his wake. Yep. Pat, what did you think of the movie Pig? <laughs> <laughs> the movie Pig. Uh, yes. Um, I, I didn't know what to think. I've just heard all the acclaim, and I was just like, okay, I don't want to like set myself up too high and just be like, crashed by the fall of expectations but honestly this is probably one of my favorite movies i've seen this year like i just loved the um the, the feel of it i loved the look of it it was just wonderfully acted immaculately shot and just like i feel like it's a movie i would put on to like feel sad too but like kind of just but it's like one of those things like you enjoy feeling sad too. At least for me, like you know, there, there might be a t- might be a day where, like you're in your feelings, you just kind of need something to, to to be in that mood with. And I kind of feel like this is kind of like this weird melancholy like zone to put yourself into, and and I don't know if kind of just wallow in it. I mean, like I wasn't, you know, uh, like super emotional like I did get a little misty eye but I wasn't like hit by like the like the hammer of it not to say that the performances didn't elicit that that's just me personally but I I love the movie I can't really think of any like major criticisms I had except for like there was like one musical cue I thought was just a little overplayed but like that's not anything <coughs> but um I I loved it I thought it was just a, a great movie I I highly recommend it hmm. Canon. Wait, what was your star rating? Born a half. Ah, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, like we've said many times, like all of us, I've been anticipating this movie for a while now. Like like Pat, I I was trying not to get too on the hype train because, you know, I've been burned on that several times. I think we're all guilty of that. Yeah. And, um... So I went into this movie with kind of a sort of idea of where they were going to go with it, and I was kind of right, but that's, that's besides the point. We'll get to that later. I really don't know right now how to convey... I mean, I know how I feel about this movie. I just don't know how to say it. That's what this show is for. You're going to hear my feelings on the show, but... As of right now, I, I I hate to do this. I'm gonna have to take back something I've said on uh, an earlier episode. What's okay. that? What's that? Uh, I now have a new favorite Nicolas Cage performance. Oh. I've always thought Lord of War was his last legit, like superb on screen uh, performance. Until this film. Again, this movie was nowhere near what I thought it was going to be. But at the same time, 
it was fantastic. Mm-hmm. It was beautifully shot. And again, Nick Cage, like, you, you know, his acting is like for a lot of films, very memeable. He's become a meme at this point, but, but I, th- th- I believe it. There's a reason why as of right now, this is his highest rated, uh, film. Uh, I'm giving it a five. I, I love this movie. It, it made me feel a lot of things, and we will talk about those things for sure. But yes, five, f- I can't believe I'm saying it. Five fucking stars for Pig. <laughs> I love this movie. Yeah. Um, I mean, and everybody listening can probably tell just how subdued we all are compared to normal. Uh, like, I, I was legitimately crying there at the end. Like, it, it hit hard because the, the theme of the movie. And I'm, this is a major spoiler for any of you listening because this is the sort of thing that a lot of people would rather know going in so they don't get like super duper side like just side swipe by it. The pig does not make it. So if that's going to bother you, just be aware. However, you do not see the demise. Right. Yeah. Right. You just you find out about it later. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but you know the whole movie the theme is is loss and and it's just. You know, it's really hard to put into words. And like I said, I, I make the joke all the time. Like sad story from my childhood, all that childhood shit. But uh, yeah, I make the joke because that's that's how you cope. Some people go off into the woods with a truffle hunting pig for 15 years. Some people do their best to pretend like everything's fine and forge their own way in the world. And some people become cutthroat food magnates who hire <laughs> tweakers to steal some dude's pig. Uh, these are all examples from the movie. Yes. Uh, but <coughs> yeah, I thought it was... It was a really gripping portrait of how different people deal with loss. And, and God, there was one speech that Cage gave to another chef about how we only get so much that we love in this world. And it was just, it was. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, I gave, that, that's that when it got a little too real for me. Yeah. The whole movie yeah. Yeah. Me anyway. Like, I, I gave it five stars. I had to. And in a 10 star rating system, this would have gotten 10 stars. <laughs> Uh, like the thing, there is one thing about this movie that irritates me, and it's the fact that so many reviews I'm seeing are saying things like, "Who knew Nicolas Cage could act?" Oh, fuck off! Fuck really? You. He's an Oscar winner. Like everybody oh, knew yeah. he could act. You pieces of shit. Like this is not some new revelation. The man's incredible. Always has been. The, these uh, have to be like young kids who haven't seen like some of his older stuff. Who, who yeah. only like know the meme or who's yeah. only yeah. Like, probably been very born around the casual. same time as the Clapper debuted. You oh, know, oh man, fuck off. <laughs> you see, you didn't think we could be funny for this show. Uh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I gave it five stars. It was. It's still not my favorite Cage movie, but I think it has a legitimate claim to being the best. It's not my favorite Cage movie. It is yeah. now my favorite Cage performance. Oh yeah, no, uh, I I absolutely would. Uh, I sold. Uh, he sold me on every fucking thing he was in this movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. I remember when uh, when Mandy came out, and we'll we'll talk about Mandy in a, a couple months. I think we have it scheduled. But there's one scene in the beginning after in the movie Mandy, the titular character is killed, and Cage loses his shit in a bathroom. Just completely destroyed. Also, low key spoiler for Mandy if you haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah. Be like, whoa, hold on. You yeah. told me a pig died that then his wife died? What the F? If you don't know, we <clears> talked also that, that's kind of the prim- one, the premise of Mandy. Also, that movie's like four or five years old. Oh, yeah. for, the lo- for, for the love of God, they're supposed to be talking about pig, and, oh. and now they're, they're talking about Mandy, a I'm movie sorry. they haven't even watched yet. I'm sorry, Frank. What the hell? <laughs> I always got to be here to make well, sure this show's on track. Is. Yeah, but, I'm here now. Let's anyway, go. There, there's a scene where shut up, Parkle. He's <laughs> it was a scene where he's dealing with his grief from that, and it's just raw and angry and yeah. powerful. Imagine that, but for a whole goddamn movie. And but, that's that's where we are with Pig. But like, whereas with Mandy, uh, and I know we'll probably talk about it when we will get to it. it there, there is definitely this over the top aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Where like the movie is very extreme in the you know like I mean even to like the heavy metal aesthetic, right. but but this is a lot more subtle, a lot more subdued, and whereas like you definitely felt like the anger out of the moment in Mandy, and then you know batshit insanity ensues. Yeah. This is definitely more contemplative, very. 
we're just going to sort of sit in the mire of it. Mm -hmm. I just meant in terms of of how real it felt. Yeah. Because that moment in Mandy is the only realistic moment in that movie. That that is, yeah, that is very true. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cajun Greatness, where we'll be discussing Mandy. (laughs) (laughs) This is the preamble to Mandy, where we also talk about how real it is to take a big, fat swig of vodka while crying in your underwear in your bathroom. (laughs) I mean... God, I, I could and chainsaw <laughs> fights. Like up until the chainsaw fights, I could probably name like six people we know that have done that at least once. Hey, I did that without even being sad. <laughs> <laughs> for I, I, me, I, for me, it was Tuesday. <laughs> Call back to last week's John Claude Van Damme episode, which was much more lively and honestly uh, emotionally enjoyable. <laughs> uh, so, the basic premise of Pig. And I will give the overview to the entire story in one sentence. A former chef with a truffle hunting pig gets the pig kidnapped and then goes through the city and a journey of his own past to find it, only to fail but still remember the human connections that made life important before. And good night, everybody. Yeah, this is Kane, your greatest. <laughs> short, no, short, short, the plug. Shortest episode ever. 20 minutes. Uh, Jonathan, where can the people find Nine you? Nine minutes? <laughs> nine, 20 minutes. We were oh, okay. 19. We're, we just hit 20. I was about to say, that was the longest nine minutes ever. Jesus. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, this movie just starts off with uh, oh, Rob and his pig. Just hanging out, looking for truffles. And not our friend Rob no. from Rob's Reviews, no. which might come back at some point whenever his schedule allows. But in this film, Nicolas Cage is named Robin Feld. Yeah, we reboot the movie, but we... Yes. <laughs> in, in, <laughs> in, in case anybody Rob thought... With our Rob. I was talking about our friend Rob, who also starred in this movie alongside <laughs> a pig. No. <laughs> He's just hanging out in the woods, collecting truffles, and then all of a sudden this dude with this... Un- the biggest and uh, most annoying Gucci belt buckle I've ever seen in my life pops up. And I was just like, uh, first impressions, I was like, wow, I'm really going to hate this guy. <laughs> it's the dude from uh, Hereditary. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. I was going to bring that up. And the Naked Brothers band. Yeah, yeah he's quite what, good. Whatever that is. That was a Nickelodeon show in the early 2000s or mid 2000s. Uh, <laughs> I was already checked out by then. I just had a thought, though. What if we remake the movie Pig, but with Rob playing the role of the pig? It's just like it's just like the same movie, but Rob has like commentary throughout. Right. Instead of instead of making the oinking noises, he's talking about tanks and ants. Yeah. And, 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 Lord, and, and, and then he just pulls out a Glock out of nowhere. <laughs> and, and it's it, like it. It's kind of it. It's silly on paper, but I'm not gonna lie. I like how they portrayed this weird, seedy, dark underbelly of fucking professional cooking. I suppose. Yeah, there's a there's a chef and wait. There's a restaurant fight club. There's a fucking restaurant fight club. To be fair, I could see Gordon Ramsay totally doing that. Well, like apparently, or, or I was thinking more like Anthony Bourdain. I was about to say, I feel like this is a story that Anthony Bourdain would tell in one of his books. Yes, or Guy Fieri just pops up. Boom, Flavor Town. He just hit like, somebody. Not somebody the <laughs> fuck out. <laughs> but um and then out of out of nowhere, uh uh the door gets kicked in and some who we learn later are some fucking tweakers just like up and uh, take the pig. No, not just a tweaker, a tweaker and a tweakette. A tweaker and a tweakette. And to be fair, though, we learned it immediately because the subtitles were labeled tweaker. This is true. I noticed that too, and I was like, wow, spoilers, fucking cap, closed captioning. Jesus. (laughs) It it just says the guy, like, if the pig had lived, they just said the guy who actually sold it. It was the guy from the pig. (laughs) It's like, oh, (laughs) goddamn. Subtitle says the guy from Hereditary's dad in this movie. What? What? I'm Motherfucker. not. I'm not gonna lie. That's. I was already getting pissed because, it's, uh, like, uh, I'm. Look, I know it was a pig and all, but it was fucking adorable. It was. A and the sounds pig, yeah. that that pig was making as it was getting dragged off, I was ready to burn the entire world down for this fucking pig. <laughs> like, you hear me? Ken would have made regular John Wick. <laughs> like, uh, fuck it. Like, I don't even know this pig. I will die for this pig. <laughs> it, it, it's like the meme from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I've I, I known this pig for 20 minutes, but I, if it, anything happens to I'll kill myself and everyone else in this room. Yeah. Same. Fair assessment. Yeah. I love that show. On that note, goodbye. Nine-Nine. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, the the pig gets napped. Yeah. Pig napped. <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, 
uh, he starts walking at that point because he tries to drive his truck, but apparently he's been sitting there for the 15 years yeah. and he's been out in the woods. And the subtitle says, Engine Explodes. You see, from, from, <laughs> see, from what I learned like uh, about a year and a half, two years ago now, it's like uh, if your vehicle is sitting out for – it has to be out at least five years. And if somebody comes along with a fresh battery, it just cranks right up and it'll just go away. Or if, if it's a Jeep from Jurassic Park, it could be sitting in the jungle for 20 years and bitch fires right back up. See, if I would have if I would have waited six years, I probably wouldn't have been able to sell the thing. Yeah. Like, if I was in a cabin in the woods and I still had that Buick LeSabre just rotting away like it's evil dead. The LeSabre? The LeSabre, yes. The LeSabre. Yeah. Also, a pig brain idea, Jurassic Pig. I'm pretty sure that's already a thing. Oink, oink, oink. I would, not, thing. I would be oink, absolutely oink, oink, shocked oink, oink, oink. if that was not a thing. Yeah, but, you know, it's Jurassic Pig, <coughs> Cajun Greatness Edition. Who is, who is the hereditary actor's name Alex again? Wolf. Alex, Alex Wolf. Wolf. Yeah. Um, shit, a shithead won me over. He, <laughs> he was a shithead with a heart of gold, let me tell you. Yeah, because, like, he has, like, this very, like, pompous and, like, very full of himself. It's like, yeah, my dad's famous, and I kind of wrote off his coattails and used my inheritance money to start my own thing. That's exactly yeah. the same thing that my dad does, but, you know, fuck my dad. Man, MJF should have been that guy. Uh, well, he would have had to have been likable by the end, and MJF is too entrenched in kayfabe to do that. Like I said, MJF should have been him in this yeah, movie. Yeah, because if, if we did the <laughs> AEW version of Pig... It, uh, it, it just would have been the, the exact same thing in the end. And then MJF would have clocked him over the back of his head. It was me. It's I like, killed the like, pig. Whoa, what are we doing? A pig? Dude, you can buy bacon at a grocery store. What are you trying over here? Okay. By the way, I could not Like he find, rolls up and then he just flips off the pig and he says, fuck that pig. I couldn't find a Jurassic Pig movie, but there is apparently a Jurassic Pork restaurant. Hmm. So I just wanted you to know that. Okay. Genetically so modified hearing, pig dinosaur field trip. food. <laughs> Heard. <laughs> Heard a kitchen term, which is relevant to this movie. Yes, so can, can, this is the part of the show where we take someone who works in the restaurant industry and tell us how accurate it is the life from, based off this movie. Uh, well, I will say that little info about using stale bread for French toast is very true. That's right, everyone. Use uh, stale bread for French toast. Get a nice cruncher on that bitch. <laughs> yeah, the, the mold really makes it special. Not, don't let it mold. Don't <laughs> listen, Pat. <laughs> We're all about life hacks here, which reminds me, actually, uh, we mentioned before, this is completely uh, separate from the movie Pig, but this is important to all our listeners. Uh, you remember we discussed how Apple Podcasts was all fucky for like six months, right? And it yeah. wouldn't refresh anything. There is a new workaround to that. The update that they've done has fixed the problem. But for a lot of people, and myself included, I had to do this yesterday, you have to delete all your podcasts like that are saved to your phone and delete the app and reinstall it. And then that that fixes it all, and, and you just have to resubscribe to everything. It's irritating, but it fixed the problem. Good so, thing I don't use Apple Podcasts. Yeah, any of our listeners who happen to use Apple Podcasts and are having trouble having everything refresh, uh, you might try that workaround. It does. It did work for me, and I hear it works for uh, most of the time. People who do that. The more you know. Yeah. So just remember to resubscribe. <laughs> right. Please, <laughs> yes. please resubscribe. Always click do that not button. leave. Come back. Don't leave us. And don't swear in the reviews. Right, no swearing. Fuck! We did get a new five-star review on uh, on the Apple Podcast. Really? Ooh. There's no words. This We're still up just the four reviews, but yep. there's six total five-star reviews. Thank you, anonymous five-star listener. That's so, right. So are you trying to tell me we are one of the highest-rated Nicolas Cage podcasts out there? I'm trying to tell you that in terms <laughs> of pure percentage... <laughs> We are one of the highest rated podcasts. We are the highest rated Nicolas Cage podcast per capita. If this were a batting average sort of thing, sure, we've only had six at bats compared to like 8,000, but it doesn't matter. We're batting a thousand, baby. That's right. We're the highest rated Nicolas Cage podcast in central Alabama. <laughs> Damn, ha- skip it. Hashtag fake it till you make it. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> Hashtag make it till you fake it. That's yeah, right. That, yeah. Wait, and if you yeah. want to support the no. highest rated Nicolas Cage based <laughs> podcast in central Alabama, <laughs> please visit our merch store at tpublic.com slash user slash caging greatness. We'll probably have some new designs at some point soon now that free comic book day is over and I can live my life again. <laughs> 
It's just going to be like breathe a, easy for one more year. <laughs> like a shirt yeah. with just a crying pig on it. <laughs> oh, no, I couldn't what, do we that. Did, what, what y'all don't realize is we had a camera, a night vision camera set up in the uh, the living room. It's just a picture of all of us crying in like the, <laughs> in like the gorilla's box. Just like, <laughs> Yeah, I, I did hear uh, when you went back to your room and, and Liz was in there, she was, are you crying? <laughs> I got a little misty. I didn't full blown like drop tears, yeah. but the feeling was there. And then she came in the living room and said, are you crying? Like, yeah. What of it? <laughs> you should know this by now. <laughs> Like I cry when I watch It's a Wonderful Life, and I do that yearly, and I still cry every single time. None of this toxic masculinity bullshit. I'm in touch with my feelings. Yeah, Shimmy <laughs> cries every time I see him, but I think yeah. that's for a different reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, God, he's back. Hi, Pat. Comes you know. in with Eric Bischoff's old theme song. I'm back, <laughs> and I'm redder than ever. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. So, uh, TM, TM, I, didn't, TM. I didn't even plan that. Yeah. It just happened. I'm sorry. I, I thought feel, it was I feel like quick word of warning. This is might be one of those podcasts where we don't talk a lot. No, I we, we hey, we only scratched the surface. The pig just got napped. There's still a lot of meat <laughs> to this potato. Hey, look, like we said earlier, we this is extemporaneous off the top of our heads, off the top of our feeling, and then all still very much in the feeling. Cuz you got to remember we used to like watch the movie, marinate a night and then record the next day. Right. And now, now we got this bomb dropped on us, and we're just like, yeah. shit. Like, I was trying to play my poker face earlier when Shimmy was just like, oh, no, we, now we have to try to be funny. I'm just like, oh, we can do it. I'm walking upstairs. I'm like, god damn it. Right. <laughs> I, I think you're trying to do it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, you almost had me w- w- when you said that. He's like, no, we can do it. But, like, you, your voice cracked on dude. <laughs> I was going up the stairs. So I was like, mm, I was walking yeah. up the stairs when I said that one. And then Liz said, are you crying? I was like, yeah. Right. Shut up. <laughs> damn it. <laughs> I was framed. <laughs> auto <laughs> auto squ- squirted water in my eyes. Auto, what did you think of the movie, pal? Are you are you he really enjoyed it? Okay, yeah, that's good. So, all right, the 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 pig got napped. Right. So Cage goes to a diner, calls for uh, the dude from Hereditary, and like because he's buying truffles from yeah him. yeah. Oh yeah, it was a stab. And wait, uh, I might be wrong. We're going back. Like they, they made the deal. You know, they handed off. He handed off a cooler of truffles, and it appeared that he handed him off a cooler of like canned goods or something. Yeah, yeah. I guess. So like, did he get paid in food? Probably supplies. So he could cook. Yeah, probably supplies. supplies. So he doesn't have to. If if, if, he's, if he doesn't care about money, then like he'll he'll need something to reach socket. I mean, there's like flour. There was yeah. canned stuff. Yeah. There are batteries for that radio. I was just making sure I didn't like uh, misunderstand. I'm, uh, but I was right. Good, good, good. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, <Excuse> me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so he he just sort of tells him like, "Look, you help me find my pig, or our deal's off. You get nothing. You lose my truffles." He says it with a lot fewer words because Nicholas Cage doesn't talk a lot in this movie. The, the, very, very measured response. But when he does, yeah. man, man, a few words. It's earth shattering. And then when he does speak, like he feels sort of the reverberations from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's one of those performances, one of those movies where. Obviously, the, the the fact that he speaks so little makes every word he says more important. It's like a Jake the Snake Roberts promo. Yeah. He doesn't have to say a lot, but what he says Ooh, matters. that's a good comparison. I Thank like you. that. That's a good one. Yeah. And so they go to uh, like a, a local... <laughs> what wooded... the fuck are you laughing at? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just imagining this same type of movie, but it's Snake, and Jake is going to look for his... Oh, <laughs> my God. DDP, let's make this fucking happen, oh, bro. Because one of the boys is pulling her rib, and they stole the damn snake. <laughs> DDP Yoga Productions proudly presents... Then we could get MJF to play the Hereditary Kids character. No, it has to be Jake. Well, no, no, Jake is Nick oh, Cage. Oh, no, it's Murder oh Hog. God. This is, oh, my God, Tony <laughs> Khan, Tony Khan, Tony Khan, please listen to our show. Oh, my God. You know he has the money to fund this shit. We can make it happen, Captain. I, I'm just waiting for <laughs> AEW to pull a WWE and ha- start their own movie studio with their, with their stars. Yeah, I hope they never do that. Just keep doing great wrestling. No one else is that is all have that big of a stage. Fucking WWE. So stu- Did you know that last uh, last week's Rampage, which is a one hour show, had like two and a half more minutes of wrestling than SmackDown that same night? I believe it. Which is two hours. Yeah. And there were three matches on Rampage. Three yeah. whole matches. Count them three. <clears throat> so they go to a farmer's market 
or like I'm looking for my pig. Oh, this is one of my favorite parts of the movie. <laughs> and so the, the lady at the farmer's market just loses her shit like, motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> and like knows exactly which tweakers are the problem. Yeah. Yeah, those fuckers hurt Wiki, I'm going to cut yeah. off some fingers or some shit. Because like this is the point in the movie where like, you know, early on you, you get a feel for tone. But then like this part happens. I mean... You can take this as a serious moment, but it can also be taken as a hilarious moment, I feel. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's de- <laughs> I think it was definitely made to break the tension a bit. Just like this this old man just walking up looking like uh, Christopher Lloyd and Dennis the Menace. Like, <laughs> I'm looking for my pig. You lost your pig? Motherfucker! Let's go. Where's my knife? <laughs> I'll cut them fingers myself. I'll show you some little piggies who won't be coming home. And they and he just like, has to fucking foot by the they, ankle. And they go to the tweaker trailer, TM, 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 <laughs> and um, ask some questions. No, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I thought one, the tweaker girl, the tweakette, I thought that was Kristen Wiig for a minute. I did. The very first moment you see her face, I did too, actually. Holy like, shit. Kristen Wiig, where the fuck? And they, apparently, it's, I don't think it is. No, it's not. Like, what that close-up <laughs> shot, I was like, oh, no, I was wrong. It's not Kristen Wiig. It's Kristen Pig. <clears throat> it's Kristen Fig, Newton, John, Olivia. So, uh, Travolta yeah. Development. Oh, welcome to Travolta Development, where we're talking about um, hairspray. Uh, we're t- <laughs> yeah, we're, welcome to Travolta Development, where we have a very serious movie where John Travolta learns about internet culture called Pog. <laughs> I hate it. Oh uh, man, but <laughs> can I get a Poggers in chat for this pig? Well, we fi- we find out that a fancy man in a suit is responsible for uh, the missing pig. Someone from the city. By the way, I just looked uh, up some some. I was looking for that quote for later, the good quote, mm-hmm. uh, and I have a fact about that. But also, just to let everyone know, the pig in the movie it was a real pig, obviously, mm-hmm. but a lot of people thought it was CGI. What? I thought that. I thought that. Wait, was who a- the fuck thought that pig was CGI? <laughs> that was a real pig. People on the internet, but the <laughs> pig's name. <laughs> pig people on real. the internet, are you? What? The pig's name is Brandy. She's Brandy. a fine girl. Yeah. She was a fine girl. But she's still alive, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, Ow. the real pig's fine. Fucking hell, that hurt. <laughs> Sorry. Darwin and Piper speaker. just, like, their they're, souls, they're like, like their body, like, what? They're like, what the fuck? God, that really hurt my ears. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now I, now, I just have to hope that the Oscars get their shit in gear and get the fucking animal Oscars going. Because I didn't give the goddamn cow and first cow an Oscar, which she was robbed. First cow? I have no idea what's going on. What? First, first cow. cow. It, it was a movie from last year. It's a really good movie. I'll tell you all Last about year later. didn't happen, so of course that movie didn't happen. What, 2019? I don't remember the first cow movie from 2019. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a black void in, in Shimmy's memory. But, it's like hotels when they skip the 13th floor. That's what we're doing with our past. Ah. Uh, 2020 was our 13th floor. Wouldn't it have been weird if we had a year 2020? <laughs> That's strange. <laughs> That would have been almost as weird as a Rocky Five or an Indiana Jones Four. <laughs> None of which happened. So we go into the city looking for the pig. All, and, all, all four of us, right. because we're that invested in this in this movie. At this Absolutely, point. Yeah. yeah. Like it's all four of us. Nicholas we go Cage all the way to the Portland from Hereditary. <laughs> like we're, we're just like gumshoeing. Like we're just walking the beat. Have you seen Hereditary, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, I, I really like that. Now, movie. now when bad. I said that, I was imagining us. Doing that bit from Hocus Pocus, where we're just like, huff, 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 just like <laughs> walking like shoulder to shoulder hey, down the street. B- bitch, get the fucking dresses. I'll put one on right now. Let's, <laughs> Let's go. <do> it. <laughs> All right, which go. one? Which Hocus Pocus? Yeah, yeah am I? which which Hocus Pocus? Which are? Uh, I don't remember the names. I'm sorry, it's uh, been a well, while. What the colors? Yeah, there's what if it's the green? Sarah the purple, Mary the red. Yeah. Uh, well, um, well, you got it. Well, you got uh, Jonathan. The hair, you got to be Sarah Jessica Parker's hocus okay. pocus. I, I guess I would be um, uh, the the other one, not the main one, the other one. Uh, Mary? I guess. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm winning for it. <laughs> Does that make me the cat? Yeah, you're the cat. All right, I'm the cat. No, that makes him that dude with his mouth was sewn shut and he took the knife and. Because imagine if you had that part in that movie and you had to do that, how. That one part was like the, the raddest fucking part in that whole movie. It was pretty sweet. I mean, now Jimmy, hold still where he put a bunch of dead leaves in your mouth. <laughs> Ew, you I didn't. forgot about that. He coughed up a lot of garbage. Oh, God, that would destroy. My allergies are already bad enough. Welcome to the Hocus Pocus podcast, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> where, we re- where we break down the movie minute by minute. <laughs> put it on the wheel. Oh, no. We almost ended up watching Hocus Pocus at um, 
uh, well, my first drive-in experience when we went to go see um, that what, Love and Monsters. Was yeah. that what it was called? That, that was playing in the, one of the adjacent um, screens. You know, I've still never been to a drive-thru. You know, it's it's cool drive-in if people movie, yeah. know how the fuck to act, you know? Y- well, yeah, they don't. Uh, uh, yeah, they don't. General. They never do. No. Even this is my first time going to a drive in theater, and I knew better drive in theater etiquette than these fucks, okay? Yeah, like somebody in front of us with their lights in front of us on for what seemed like a goddamn eternity, and then I finally get out of the truck and I take five really aggressive steps their way, and then I see somebody jump out of the back of that bitch and then take the keys out of the ignition. I was just like, Fucking thank you, and just walk back to the truck. Just like, who leaves uh, their lights on at a fucking drive? Like Jesus Christ! I mean, it sucks enough if your lights are facing towards the screen, other people, and but but they were facing towards us, so we had lights blaring in our eyes. We couldn't fucking see. Also, the one car was smoking some dink. Oh, it was that was- van. There was a couple of cars down the oh, way. Oh God! It was yeah. like just. Bellowing out of they the got, fucking thing. They got like, like it was a goddamn boxes. chimney smokestack. <sighs> so when we go to the city, where do we end up first? Uh, I, I know it culminates in the Fight Club. Well, first they, they oh uh, yeah yeah they they go to find Edgar, Edgar. the guy who does the Fight Club, who tells uh, Nicholas Cage that his name's not worth anything anymore. Yeah, we're learning bit by bit here. <coughs> we're yeah. still in the dark about his character. At Super this point. in the dark. And so he goes into another restaurant and pulls away, like, the basement pulls away the rack of food and, like, fucking underground fight club. Yeah. Like, if, like, that's probably, like, not necessarily wonky, but the one moment in the film where I'm like, what the fuck? I mean, it's simple like the most, I mean, the whole movie is is outrageous, but, like, the the fact that, you know, there's a underground fight club for chefs it's, it's like that's pretty like it's far fetched, but like you know, I was like, "What the fuck?" But like you know what, I'm on this train. Well, like for context, it's not necessarily a fight club. From what I see, they hit like what appears to be like a minute timer, and a dude puts his hands behind his back, and I guess they see how long they can take getting the holy fucking shit beat out of them see, by I, another random member of some kitchen staff somewhere. See, what I thought it was was that the the chef or like whoever it is that works in the restaurant would uh, put their name on the board and then whoever out in the audience or like the, in the crowd wants to beat the fuck out Wait of them a minute. would pay to do it. Wait. Whoever bids the highest, the chef gets that money in exchange for getting a minute to get the shit kicked out of them by the person who hates them. So what you're saying is a lot of people are essentially um, dropping money and then also beating the shit out of their Boss. Yeah, the bosses are prostituting themselves for lots of money to be punched in the face. Is what I got out of it. I'm gonna double check. And I was make about sure. to say because yeah, like that, that's I sort of what I got. Too. I didn't get that, but since you put it that way, it makes a lot more sense to me. Because I mean, how many people you think would pay a shitload of money to beat the fuck out of like Gordon Ramsay? I imagine mm. quite a lot. It's like is everybody who has PTSD uh, I mean, from to be, Hell's Kitchen. To be fair, uh, I think it's pretty much all but confirmed that he really hams it up for the show. He's really not that mean. Yeah, but I mean, there are some of those people from like Kitchen Nightmares who despise. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, shit, like, I get those it. guys. Yeah. yeah. It's like how dare Amy's he expose company. how gross my restaurant was that I deliberately let fall into ruin. <laughs> Man, yeah. I miss Kitchen Nightmares. I mean, I like um, Twenty Four Hours of Hell and Back uh, enough, but. I mean, it's essentially the same show, but it literally happens in a 24-hour span. But I don't know. I kind of miss the simplicity of the old ways, I suppose. No, but I'm, now I'm just thinking, like, who on the Food Network could take the most punches? Like, you know, you, you walk in there and, and, like, fucking, like, Robert Irving shows up with his fucking white ass. Hmm. The part of me feels like he might have a glass jaw. Now, oh. Diana De Laurentiis, she can fucking take it on the chin. <laughs> <laughs> she I mean, sticks it out like, try me, bitch. I mean, I have to imagine that there's a legion of people who would pay a lot of money to beat the fuck out of Rachel Ray. I, I was thinking Bobby Flay. Like, I've heard, I've never yeah, heard a good it. thing about Rachel Ray. Like, from anyone who's met her, who's worked on sets, like, she is the Ellen of, of food. She's things. the Ellen of food. Like, she her. is apparently the goddamn devil. But but the guy taking all the bets, that's Alton Brown. You know he's the fucking mastermind <laughs> of that bullshit. In this case, it'd be Edgar Brown. It, it's, 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 it's <laughs> that he films it instead of calling good eats, he calls it good beats. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, he like he he rolls up into this Fight Club after he gives like a like a brief explanation as to what it is to a Hereditary Boy. I'm just going to call him Hereditary Boy for the rest of the movie, <laughs> the movie, the podcast. Um, he just shows up, doesn't say a word, um, writes his name on the board, and then all of a sudden, Mister, your name don't mean shit. Has to eat his fucking words because like everybody just like stops, looks, and just st- starts dropping money on the table left and right. Just, um, let's go. I want to punch this dude in the face. Yeah. I'm just like, what did what did he do to you? Apparently, he's a really good chef. What if? No, that, that wouldn't make sense. Well, I mean, he that one chef he runs into shortly after this got fired after two months because he kept overcooking pasta. So it seems yeah. like Nicolas Cage was a very exacting sort of chef. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, Which to be fair, fair, if somebody kept fucking up the pasta for two straight months at my restaurant, I'd fire his ass too. Yeah. Like, like, That's just me. <laughs> like, it's not as, as though he was like just like tyrant in the back of the day. It's just like he's very, he was very just sort of clipped and response and precise. So like if, if he just weren't up to snuff, he would just be like no, just like passionless and just sort of cut you off. Yeah, yeah. but it's like it's all in the details to him. Like he tells you later in the movie that he literally remembers every plate of food he has served. Every he person. remembers every face he saw while serving that food and just, making that food. Just like you know, it's an, I, I kind of like that. That, that. that was a very like you know. Fan, fantasy like anime thing it's like that's I, I like that yeah. and, and just sort of a little like elevated realism not to not to the extent of magical realism but just like it's just it's just to the left of reality yeah there's a like a little bit absurdity like I think the fight club is the most like absurd aspect yeah. of this movie but um because but it, cause after this it, it pr- it's pretty grounded for the most part yeah. there was that one extended scene where Nicolas Cage goes to his old house and sit next to a strange boy while covered in blood looking like a homeless man and isn't driven off the porch with a broom or a shotgun by an angry parent. That is true. But tell me that scene happening in a movie like 25 years ago and it's fine. Yeah. Because that happens. Oh, yeah. But, but 25 I'm, years ago all the time. I was time. actually pleasantly surprised they didn't go there. Yeah. Because I was the whole time I was like, he's about to get killed by some angry parent. Like some, like some parent's going to take a bat to his face. But it didn't happen. It was just a weird little nice scene. Yeah, yeah reminiscing about a persimmon. I want one yeah. of those things that kid had. Oh, oh yeah, the hand, hand, hand pan. pan. Yeah, yeah a little hand pan. Yeah. yeah, that was pretty cool. Expensive. Really? Yeah, like for a bigger one, it's like four or five hundred dollars. I just want that little baby one he had. Uh, that one's probably about one fifty. I mean, it, maybe it, it kind of looks like a like one of those. <sighs> I thought it was the bowl that mm, when you like rolled the stick around it at first. I, I was thinking it's, it's kind of like the bread they use for bread bowls at Panera, but it's just like the little kid just tapping on it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's waiting for it to get stale so he can make French toast out of it. Ah, so after the fight club, he gets uh, sent to a restaurant okay, that's chefed yeah. by uh, one of his former line cooks or prep cooks, the same one he yeah. fired for two, mo- or two months of overcooking pasta. Is that the actor who followed us on yeah, Twitter? Yeah, uh, the actor in who plays Chef Fenway in that scene is uh, David Nell who followed us on Twitter so oh. shout out to David Nell that was a great scene shout singer. out yeah, yeah. No, and, and he was really a really fantastic. great performance yeah. I'm not just sucking ass here yeah, me <laughs> either I was just like damn dude dude yeah, really good the whole time he's presenting this dish that he clearly doesn't give two flying fucks about it's just there to be fancy because that's what the people in Portland want for a it's, it's, a, it's a very elaborate like deconstructed meal yeah. and it's like literally like an it's diameter of like yeah. food yeah. it is a smoke filled fish bowl of bullshit yeah and so what it cage is. the yeah. whole time is, is like i thought you wanted to open a pub he's like no no this is just no money in a pub and the whole time that cage is like he's like this is deconstructed food and so cage proceeds to deconstruct this man's entire life yeah and the whole time uh that I, what's his name that actor david nell david nell you can see the conflict because he keeps laughing because he's super nervous. He realizes that his whole life is fucked and he's miserable, but he's trying his best to continue. It's, it's just a really... You, you see the facade he puts up and as it slowly just chipped away. Yeah. yeah. And, Meanwhile, he's making like Attack on Titan faces can, while he's trying to like hold things yeah. back. Like, and and the it's kind of like, creepy, but David, in a good I mean, way. Oh, uh, David. Uh, Nicholas Cage, he's not being malicious. He's just being very forward and direct. Mm-hmm. Very it. frank. Yeah. And like and I've got the quote pulled up, like the last chunk of it that, that really matters. Because it's not just the facade that's breaking uh, on this other chef whose name is Derek. Like, you see there's no facade there anymore. 
Like it's just become a, a glass pane, and he's hiding behind it, even though you can see everything. And and uh, the quote is, Derek, why do you care about these people? They don't care about you, none of them. They don't even know you because you haven't shown them. Every day you wake up and they'll be less of you. You live your life for them and they don't even see you. You don't even see yourself. We don't get a lot of things to really care about. And the things I saw in an interview, the thing I mentioned just a second ago, Cage had to fight to keep that line in the movie. What? They really? wanted to take it out. And he's like, no, this is the whole point of the movie. This is why I'm playing this character. The line stays in. Yeah. That's, like, that's like the emotional yeah. crutch of the movie in like a single line. Like yeah. If that's not in, he's literally just like staring a hole into the guy until he like <laughs> cro- like just breaks. Yeah. <laughs> wine. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. No, he guzzled that wine. Oh, yeah. but I, I'm just imagining like if, de- if this scene, but it's like just Persona 5 and they're just like breaking somebody's heart to like yeah. reform them. Now I'm just imagining if it was starring Jake the Snake Roberts like, you either tell me where that goddamn pig is <laughs> or I'm gonna DDT your ass right now. That's a good impression. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that was really good. That was that solid. Was good. Oh, shit. I, I, plus, I love just how lateral your face got. Well, some, yeah. sometimes, again, going back to committing to the bit, sometimes making the face helps. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. Making the face absolutely helps. But I have never done a Jake the Snake before. Oh, my God. I need good. to save these for the whenever the fuck the impressions <laughs> podcast gets landed on. God damn. <laughs> shit. <laughs> no, see, what, what happens is like we do an episode, but it's just canon, but he's doing different Character, so <laughs> it's, it's canon's one yeah. man show. Yeah, and be... we just all write down what we want him to say as different characters. Hey, y'all joke. <laughs> if I can do it, I might be up for that. <laughs> if you're up to cut it, I'm up to record it. <laughs> <laughs> or try to record a it. very special episode of Cajun Greatness one night in canon. <laughs> Granted, it's only going to be about like ten minutes long. It's going to be a short. <laughs> it's going to be a short episode. But uh, before we leave the that scene like one of the things i do enjoy about this movie is something the movie i don't think it's like the major theme but something it comments on is pretension and pretentiousness oh, yes. yeah. because like all throughout the movie alex wolf's character is like listening to like some sort of like npr classical station like instead of listening to music He's like listening to some dickhead's version of what makes music good. Yeah, yeah. well, and it's not just like classical music because yeah. like there were like pieces of like the Mozart's Requiem, which, yeah. as cliched as it is, I really love that piece of music. However, the the British guy they have narrating uh, or like talking over the music, yeah, which also is in of itself pretentious. But also, like, uh, there are multiple times where he's like, oh, a classical uh, music is the only legit form of music, is the highest <laughs> form of music. And, and there was uh, the last one really stuck out to me where he uh, was talking about the elements of music are melody, harmony, and rhythm, which is a really reductive way of looking at music. You'll, you'll hear, like, idiots like Ben Shapiro use this to justify very bigoted worldviews about music. And I know this is not even what the movie is about, but at the same time, I think like, and especially that speech where, you know, this guy is literally trying to get the approval of all these critics, all these hoity toity upper echelon people. But like all he really wants to do is open a pub. (laughs) Yeah. And, and all and all, like Nick Cage wants to do is find his pig. Yeah, and N- nothing more, nothing less. And and sometimes even some things that are that mundane can have much more of an emotional impact than something like this deconstructing local food or whatever bullshit postmodern bullshit he was trying to spew. And what I think is interesting that somehow even though you can say this. Chef was sort of breaking down the elements of food to make this new type of presentation, this new type of meal. You, you can compare it to someone who cooks very simply, but still has like you know this mm-hmm. very impressive like force of like flavor and impact, which comes up. We'll get to later. I, I think it's interesting, like how just the, the juxtaposition of those two things. Like you're one somehow one's breaking down the elements, but he just sort of reduces them to less than their parts. Whereas you have yeah. someone who's cooking very simple things that, uh, like, they're it's they're greater than the sum of their parts when you put them together. Exactly, mm-hmm. and I think like 
while like postmodernism was very important in sort of like the big global like art or just like I guess just art movement in general, I, I, I there's definitely this pushback and I kind of agree with it in that that you can sort of deconstruct, break things down all you want, but at the same time there are certain tropes, certain techniques that were popular for a reason. Mm -hmm. And when you're just breaking things down for the sake of breaking things down and don't have any sort of elevated intent behind it, it's like, well, what's the fucking point? When when you can make something that is more real, more genuine, and, and actually has an emotional impact. And I think a lot of artists, whether they be like musicians, filmmakers, like actual like physical like artists will kind of go through this i know i've done this with music where like i want to make the most complex thing ever something that basically to show off how like fucking clever i am but in doing that you lose that genuine human element where while you're trying to seek the improvement and try to i guess make yourself look good to other people you're uh, disconnected from what really matters, in my opinion. And I think that's that's very like a good point because even though there's a there's a certain part of this movie where I can sort of see the pieces falling into place, but I feel like just because you can like foretell a story's direction doesn't necessarily undercut the impact or like what mm-hmm. it's doing or what it's exactly. trying to say because like you can make something that's unpredictable and it, it, it could just be just random bullshit happening where it's like oh it goes in one direction it cuts in a different direction that in itself isn't like artful it's like how you use pre-existing tools pre-existing elements and just sort of do that in a, in a you know a, a meaningful way yeah and not even like completely rejecting the idea of like deconstruction because you can do that artfully but i think a lot of people sort of saw the aesthetics of what a lot of these originators of deconstruction were trying to do and they they only took the surface level uh aesthetics from it and you know you end up with something lesser well it's like how in, in movies christopher nolan's dark knight trilogy you know it was a it was a new thing it was very new take on the superhero genre and, and a lot of like action movies in general. And then every movie studio afterwards learned the wrong lessons. Yeah, or, or like uh, how with Watchmen in the eighties, how mm-hmm. like basically the reaction to that ruined comics for in the nineties. That and Dark Knight Returns, yeah. That too, like because you, you know, like was, both of those stories have you, you know very poignant things to say about the mediums they're working in. But when all you take is sort of the grim, dark aspects of it, you end up with something that's very superficial. And and with Watchmen, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons have both said they regret what it did to the comic book industry. Oh yeah, I, I, and I like especially Alan Moore is very self aware in that aspect. Yeah, what He's is the thing grumpy. they did to the comic industry? They made it grim and gritty and grumpy for thirty years. I mean. It doesn't all have to be that way, but if done well, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, well, but I get, well, I get it. I well, get well, it. The I thing, get it. And then what we're trying to say is what Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons were doing and Frank Miller before he went off his meds yeah. was um, <laughs> that was artfully done. And like Watchmen's one of my favorite pieces of fiction of all time. And, and it, it definitely has like a darker edge to it because it's trying to like the whole premise of it is what if superheroes were in real life this is what would happen it, mm-hmm. it shows a darker under, under but current, there, but uh, there's but there's still like a human element to it whereas you know you take like the Todd McFarlane's and Rob Liefeld I'd rather it. not <laughs> yeah well, well yeah that, that's what I'm saying is just like I am so tortured we're, we're, and all no. my all the women in my life have been killed basically blah, blah, blah. basically it's the lesson that was supposed to be taken from Watchmen and Dark Knight Returns is that before all that comics were absolutely for kids it was it was Adam West Batman was the most popular iteration of Batman uh, the lesson that should have been taken was there's a place for adult mature storytelling in comics same places there is for you know uh, the the younger stories or the sillier stories there's room for everything and the lesson that was taken was instead if it's not grim and gritty we don't fucking want it fuck you exactly 
We're, we're just sort of like nerds, somber and, <laughs> and morose and violent, but there's like no substance behind it. It's just like, yeah. let, let's just think of the most fucked up things we can and just like put this run these characters through the mud and that's all there is to it it's just sort of like meaningless suffering yeah like it took near 20 years before there was any legitimate fun or happiness in major comic books like they tried to make the fantastic four grim and gritty like we're broke and also they're suing us it's like fuck you it's an adventure comic what was was that the part where sue storm had a a cleavage window that shaped like the number four that was uh, this was after that the cleavage window was actually from her being uh, manipulated mentally, and that was a, a, another personality called Malice, who wore a lot of leather dominatrix gear. I see. I feel like that, that's kind of not okay. It was terrible, well, especially this is like a very supported matronly figure, and it's just like, what if she was just like this sexy dominatrix? It's yeah. like let's let's do. The Dark Phoenix saga, but bad. That was the same time where Wonder Woman, uh, she wore the one piece. She didn't have like the flappy skirt type bits, like the the classic Greek type uh, armor skirt. It was just like a one piece. And they kept making the artist draw it higher and higher and higher up her ass. Yeah. It was the same time period. Yep. Roll Tide. Yeah. And then also they had Barbara Gordon get shot and molested by the Joker. Yeah. That's definitely one thing I, I'm not a huge fan of Malin Moore for. <laughs> like, the story, it, I get it, but I also hate it. Well, I mean, even Alan Moore hates that story. Yeah. You know what I hate more than that? The animated version of that story. Oh, Where Batman which is even, it's, Bar- which is Batman? somehow... Uh, which is somehow fucking worse. For some reason, Paul Dini just has this thing where he wants Barbara to fuck Bruce all the time. Why? I don't know. It was a thing in the animated series... It was a thing in this Killing Joke. It's been a thing in the comics that he's written. He's he just wants him to fuck yeah, Barbara. That's yeah, there, so there's weird. definitely a lot of uh, comic writers who have a very specific thing in their writing that always comes up, and it's mm-hmm. always just sort of present, like how um, <coughs> Brian Michael Bendis has an unhealthy exception with uh, Kitty Pride from X-Men and wants her to be in everything, because apparently he just owns that character because he, he likes it, her a lot. Well, not anymore. He's at DC. Yeah. So. Um, and how Tarantino likes feet. Yeah. So uh, he likes the piggies, doesn't he? Hey, he so, does like the piggies. But, but, he, but, he takes them but, home. Before we uh, get off of comics, I wanted to tell you. Uh, you know that uh, Trailer Park Boys uh, preview you got in the case? Yeah. You should actually read it. Okay. Uh, I, you you definitely get a kick out of the first story in there. Okay. You were talking about Liefeld earlier. Uh, there, there's a bit where uh, they find out that Randy has this. Um, storage locker full of old comic books. Turns out he has a lot of fucking nineties garbage. Oh no! And then ran- <laughs> and then Julian's sitting there with his with his with his liquor drink going. <laughs> He's just like it's like what is it with guys in the nineties to know how to fucking draw ankles or fucking feet or nothing? <laughs> 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 oh man! But yeah, it's fun. Rob Liefeld sucks. He does. All right, so um, we're at that point. We're gonna take a real quick break. Okay. And then come back uh, and finish up. If like, yeah, I feel like we we got like maybe another thirty minutes or so in us, but I don't want to risk it with the recording. So we're gonna take a quick break, and we will be right back to finish up with Pig. Oink oink. Bye. Thank you for listening to Caging Greatness. If you enjoy what you're hearing, stay tuned for the second half of tonight's show. And if you'd like to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you want to support the show financially, find our merch store at tpublic.com slash user slash caging greatness. Or just send us money. Appreciate money. Enjoy the rest of the show and never let anyone cage your greatness. Don't you believe me? Anyway, welcome oh, back yeah. <laughs> uh, to the Bruce Hornsby Hour, where we just sing That's Just the Way It Is for the next 45 minutes. Which was then uh, sampled by Tupac Shakur. That's the that's what I was going for, but yeah, that guy too. I love the original song. It's on my phone. (laughs) It's a good one. Yeah.
Anyway, um, oh god. <laughs> so we are back to finish up talking about Pig. I hope you Pig. enjoyed uh, yet another recycled commercial from our past. But again, now that Free Comic Day is over, I'm, I'm going to be able to, to focus a little bit more on some new content for stuff. I mean, at this point, I don't understand how how we don't have a sponsorship from the Clapper. Yeah, I is mean, that still around? Yeah, no, as far as I'm aware. Do we know? Like, this isn't even for a bit. I really want to know at this point. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. I'm gonna look that up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not gonna lie. Earlier, um, you're doing it now. You were doing it earlier, but when y'all were playing with the bottle caps, for some reason, it sounded like a cricket was getting ready to just start going. And I thought that's what it was. Like, Cannon was primed and ready to attack. I was ready to attack. I was like, Otto, what the fuck are you looking at, dude? You want to swing on me, bro? You want to swing? <gasps> you swung on me, bro. I'm a man. Oh, I just elbowed the fucking mic stand. Oh, <laughs> now Otto's angry? Oh, okay. All right. You know what? Yeah, you're, you're showing your true colors. You really didn't like pig, did you? You can still buy the Did you? Out. Yeah, you can still buy it. <laughs> Clapper, holler at your boy. We say your name literally every episode at this point. It might be our longest running bit. Might be, actually, yeah. yeah. Someone who's not me, go back and count all the times we've done the clapper bit. Sure. <laughs> Someone that's not that. <laughs> I like it. Because, you know, sometimes it gets a little hard keeping up with the minutia on the shows that you're on, and I would like someone I mean, else to do that. That's, well, that's why we need a super fan. We need somebody to, to do that, to listen to all this bullshit that we do. Because, you know, we're not going to do it. It ain't, it ain't easy being your own biggest fan. We are just we just turn off our brains and talk about dumb shit. Or, like, work through our feelings. And, until the, the shit we... Until the, quote, <laughs> dumb shit makes us sad. Yeah. <laughs> Pig is not dumb shit. It is no, great it shit. Is As so I good. mentioned earlier, I gave it five stars in case you have forgotten. So did I. And Pat <laughs> gave it four and a half, and Jonathan is going to reveal yeah, his oh, score. Oh, we still at the don't end know of the, the episode. Score yet. We shall see. Or, or next episode. I don't know. No pressure. Just whatever. Uh, so anyway, uh, Nicholas Cage destroys this one chef's life just with words. <laughs> and uh, then we're off because the chef revealed that it was Hereditary Kid's dad what took the pig. Yeah, it was so, him all along. So see? Cage is mad and he starts just stomping the shit out of the dude's Camaro. It's like, that's yeah. my Camaro. Fuck. It's like, I remember he threatened earlier. He goes, hey, you like that car? You like that shirt? And I was like, that was his way of saying I'm going to fuck you up, dude, if yeah. we're going to Portland. <laughs> and so he, uh, he ends up walking to uh, the, the guy's house. Yeah. Well, not all the way, because he steals the he bike. He steals a bike. He does which, and which, screams which at is a ramp. great bit, because he just, he just in a huff walks off from Alex Wolf, and he, he cuts back to the neighborhood, and he pulls a bike off a port, and you see somebody come up. It's like, ah! He just scares them off, yeah. and it just cuts to him, like, just, like, riding the bike down the street. The funniest cut. It was pretty great. <laughs> It's good shit. So he gets there, and uh, this is uh, he, he's he's talking to the guy, and the guy's like, "Look, my son's not cut out for this. Also, you're not getting your pig back. It's just business. I'm going to give you money, and you're going to leave. Try to fuck with me, and I'll turn it into bacon." Now, what I thought was a great bit is that when when the when Alex Wolf's father shows up, uh, played by Anna Markin, um. Uh, I legit it's like it, no they did not put Paul Hollywood in this movie because the bad guy looks like he's from the British Bake Off he does he really did <laughs> and it's like those sons of bitches what if that's what they were going for I mean I can see it I've seen what, what was that actor's name again uh, his name is Adam Arkin uh, I've seen him in other things he is pretty good at being a slimy uh, uh, sleazeball so yeah he did good in this movie yep. yeah yeah that's like I was like, you took the pig. I fucking hate your face. Yeah, where he's, <laughs> where he's like the most powerful restaurateur in Portland, Oregon. And, uh, you know, he has the pig and, he's, and he just has all the money in the world <laughs> to try to uh, placate Cage. But Cage, he doesn't want no money. He's he do not want no fame. All he wants is his pig. And it's also Alan Arkin's kid. Yep. Yeah. Alan Arkin, famous actor. That guy. He was in Get Smart. That guy. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, that I guy. I had no yeah, ideas. Yeah, you know, famous actor. Uh, Little Miss Sunshine, Edward Scissorhands. Oh, yeah, he was the granddad. The Rocketeer. Yeah. 
Yes, he was in the Rocketeer. Yeah, Rocket I wouldn't wow. touch that if I were you. God, we gotta fucking watch the Rocketeer. Yeah. <sighs> it's it's, on, like the, it's Rocketeer. on the Canon birthday I, short. I, oh God, I have so many for my list. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll probably end up just having to spin a wheel. <laughs> probably. <laughs> or you could just pick an actor you really like and go with that the way I did. Find someone who's in all the movies you want to watch. <laughs> okay. Right, so uh, Michael Chiklis, it is. <laughs> no, <laughs> all right, we're watching both Fantastic Fours. I mean, I'll I'll take it over a Fan Four stick any day. God no yes. matter how bad those movies are, it's nothing compared <clears throat> to that one. Not at all. Also, we need more Ian McGruffold in movies. Yeah, yeah. Well, apparently he's a dirty family leaving cheating bastard now. Yeah. And, I mean, and say what you will, Michael Chiklis is still best on screen thing. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. So. Uh, Nicholas Cage is now sad. He's like, I want my pig, damn it. And uh, he meets Hereditary Kid outside, and they have a, a brief discussion where like, they reveal a little bit more about each other. And then Nicholas Cage has this idea, because earlier in the film, uh, the kid had talked about how his parents remembered that one meal they had that Nicholas Cage cooked for them that was the happiest they'd ever been, and they talked about it all the time. And so Cage is like, I'm going to get my pig back. And so he sends the boy off to do uh, errands while he goes and does another errand. He goes to his old uh, restaurant, which has been turned into a bakery by the person he left in charge, gets a salted baguette. And then uh, together they go back to the dude's dad's house and they make that same meal. And and this whole scene, I loved this scene. Yeah, it was good. Because <laughs> uh, the montage of cooking was great because you could see like they're both getting into it. Like, like Nicolas Cage was remembering his love for food. And the hereditary kid was like discovering this sort of joy from it, and it's like he's having like this kind of like father son moment with Nicolas Cage. I thought was a very sweet. And plus, I just let the whole bit of just like how the the bad guy is like, you know, if you do anything with fuck with to fuck with me, I will brain down the hell on you. And Nicolas Cage's like, I'm not gonna fight it back with guns and army. And how far what I'm gonna do, my grandmaster plan is to break this son of a bitch by making the most emotionally poignant meal that he's ever had and throwing it back in his face and just breaking oh, his man. mind. It, that that yeah. God fucking Damn it, I love this movie. Mm-hmm. Oh, that was such a good scene. Because it's so tense, it's quiet, nobody's saying anything. And so they sit down and Cage starts eating. And no one else is moving, and he just points to food, like, go ahead and eat. Like, fucking eat, you assholes. I just made this food. Eat. And so uh, the evil dad takes a bite, and he's like, okay, okay. Takes a drink of wine and has another bite, and that's when he just, like, he, he breaks. Everything comes flooding back, and he just gets up and runs to his office to down some whiskey. I remember him doing a very audible, like, it said, hmm, on the screen, but it sounded like a half-ass moan after that yeah. first bite. He was I, like, I think mm. it was like a, a like a stifled sob. Oh, man, he got a little wet and, down there. And, and <laughs> I think why that scene is so powerful, other than, like, he's just remembering just, like, one, like, moment of a truly happiness he had with his wife and their very tumultuous relationship because the wife also tried to kill herself and now she's alive on tubes inside of like a care home that's yeah. another important point and it's just that taste and smell are the two senses that are closely tied to memory and for him to, it, it almost seems like a fucking evil trick to an extent how Nicholas Cage emotionally manipulates this man with a, a gorgeously cooked meal but it's well just, I mean it is like John Wick busting up with all the guns and I mean shit. I know that that's the point but I kind of like, I, I just I just loving all the different little beats in that and like mm-hmm. the fact that you know that w- we can smell or taste something that instantly throws us back not only to like a particular thing but to like a just a whole moment landscape in our own memories mm-hmm. it's like just imagine he's just like picking up the phone and just like it's like hello uh this is felds i have a very particular set of skills <laughs> <laughs> skills that are very delicious for men like you <laughs> Like, what I liked was that you could see this guy's heart literally grow three sizes. Yeah. Because uh, immediately Cage is like, I want my pig, man. Uh, he didn't say, I'm paraphrasing. He's just staring at him pointedly, screaming in his head, where's my pig? I want my orker back. And that's when this guy breaks down. He's like, I'm sorry. Those damn tweakers were too rough. The pig didn't make it. By the time it came to me, it was already dead. And then Cage just drops. He just completely breaks down. 
and it was gut wrenching. Yeah. yeah, like that shit hurt. Like I took like all the sound out in that particular scene, and it was really tense. I, now that I think about it, there. Were, I mean, mu- music was in this movie. It wasn't in there a lot. No, there wasn't a whole lot of like background music. Yeah, there's not like not a lot of original soundtrack. But you know, I. Some the movies don't need it. There was very. Good. Oh yeah, it was, was really fantastic. good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so not downplaying the music that yeah. was there. So hereditary right. kid Nicholas Cage, they go to a, the diner from the beginning of the movie. Uh, they have brownies and coffee, and then Nicholas Cage is like, "I think I'm gonna walk," and so the hereditary kid just gets in his car and fucking cries because after the, right before that, Cage is like, "We'll see you Thursday," showing that he forgives him because it wasn't the kid's fault yeah. that his dad's a piece of shit. And that he'll he'll keep hunting truffles, and that he'll have that relationship still. And so the kid gets in his Camaro and just cries. And Cage walks back to his cabin, and, and it's it's very quiet. He washes the blood from his face that's been there the entire movie. And the soundtrack in this part I really liked, as it's just panning through the inside of his cabin as he's walking back to the cabin itself. It was one of the best shots in the movie. It was beautiful. Mm-hmm. So he sits down. He puts this cassette in of his wife that his wife had made for him before she died, which is what caused him to go into the woods in the first place. Just takes off his boots, sits there, and just looks up at the sky. And that that's where the movie ends. Yeah. And that scene was just so... like Because I think most of us have been there. like Maybe yeah. not for the same reasons, but just where we're sitting on the bed, we're, we're just done. We're completely done, and everything hurts, but we don't know what else we can do. We're just going to have to go to bed and get up the next morning and continue with what we're doing. Let's do it all over again. And something I think is very interesting, because this is like a deconstruction of like this, the roaring rampage story. Like I'm going to just take, take, turn over heaven and earth to get what I want. And then what, what, I, what I find so neat is that literally everyone he'd come across – in an ordinary movie, they would lose everything as they come in contact with him. And really, a lot of the people that he met, they were able to get something out of that moment with him. Whereas at the end of the movie, he uh, ends up with nothing because his pig dies. It's like his whole journey sort of ends with him going back home with nothing, where all these other people he'd come in contact with, at least they had this moment of like, I can rethink, I can rebuild because we, that one chef. Uh, David Nell played so he realizes this restaurant isn't what I really wanted it gives him a chance to reevaluate what his goals are what he wants to be as a chef and with uh, Alex Wolf's character and even his father they have a chance to rebuild their relationship they, they can take something for this and like so we see like Nicholas Cage in, in the movie with nothing he doesn't have a prize although you, you could say like even him still learn something he still gets something because in the beginning of the movie he starts to play the tape of his uh of his wife but he stops it because he, he can't bear to to listen to his dead wife and at the end he's able to listen to that entire tape and i'd like to think that that just through resuming his partnership with uh amir the hereditary kid in the movie's name's amir um just resuming his partnership with him and having interacted with all these people who were touched by him yeah, I, I, the, the optimist in me would like to think that that might encourage him to, you know, start venturing out more, maybe resuming real life. Because like the pig was a substitute for his co- connection with human beings. Because yeah, and, and even though he was able to like live and have you know, I, I would say an enjoyable life to himself with the pig, it's just like that sort of removes himself from society and like him sort of going on this journey. It helps him sort of find refine his humanity in a way, and I feel like that's I think that's a, that's a very poignant thing to be able to come across in the movie. Yeah. Uh, so, in short, go watch this movie if you haven't seen it yes, yet. Yes, please. It's fantastic, and uh, you know, it's it's one of our quicker episodes, especially of late. But you know, we we've gone through the whole movie, and aside from you know, go fucking see it. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Not much else to say. <laughs> Uh, except, I'm curious now, Jonathan, have we settled on something? Uh, I think I'm sitting at a four. Oh, okay. okay. There we go. Uh, th- th- there are uh, some parts of the movie, I think, for as short as it is, it's only about 90 minutes. The, I guess this is sort of a nitpick for me. It does kind of drag, and I know part of that's the point. It's part of the like setting up the tone and atmosphere, and I do appreciate that, but... I, I know there were like 
a couple moments in the middle where it was kind of like, okay, where is this like, where is this going? And then once he gets to the part three, like when they start cooking the meal and then have the scene with the dad and stuff like that, that's where it was like, okay. This is what all it was culminating to. But like, I can I can see sort of like the whole bit with like him, the little kid, like that might be a little bit of dithering. But you know, like that's kind of negligible. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it. it well, because that was his old house. So, like the point of he's like you said, the beginning, the cassette tape. He couldn't bear to to listen to his wife's voice for more than twelve seconds. But now he's been forced to get back out in the world, so he goes to his old house and he's. He's confronting his past as opposed to what he's been doing for the past 15 years, which was running from it. Because he was a legendary, super successful, revered chef. But his wife died and he ran away from the world. And so now he's been forced to, to start interacting again. So, well, I, I can see it both ways. So, like, I can see how that kind of feel like this is, a, this is an aside or this is sort of helps flesh out him yeah. reintegrating into the world and, and accessing the things that he's sort of trying to keep distant in his head. Mm-hmm. I can see how that, at least in that one scene, is like the, yeah. the plus and minus. And, like, and another scene that I really appreciated, um, that moment when they were out chilling by his car after they had left uh, uh, Amir's dad's house. Um, he was talking, He that's when uh, Rob finally admitted that like, it's like he can find the truffles on his own. He doesn't need the pig to find his truffles. He just, that pig was his life. Yeah, and it really just, meant a lot to him. Yeah, just wanted his pig back. Yeah, and I think that I think there was sort of like a double meaning there. When it's like, well, I don't need the the pig to find truffles. Well, what are we doing all this for? I love her. I think he was talking about the pig, and I think he was talking about his wife. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's just at least it's really gripping and and pretty powerful. I well, thought like I was. I'm not gonna lie. I was <clears throat> I was starting to. Be, uh, Obviously, I was believing the hype a bit there, but I always get worried with these movies because, like, because before we watch this, we watched the trailer for uh, Prisoners of Ghostland, right? Yeah. In Ghostland or whatever. Prisoners yeah. of obviously Ghostland. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie, that movie looks hype as shit. It looks completely batshit insane. I'm so excited. Oh, for real? Like, like, <laughs> but like, like I said, when we, after we watched that trailer, I'm like, how did they pinpoint like my like? Planets align interest. Like it reminds me of a movie that apparently I'm the only human being who ever saw, but it's called Doomsday with Rona Mitra. I never, seen never it. heard of it. Exactly, uh, but it was like weird post-apocalyptic primal tribal warfare shit. Does like come around like in the days of like the death races and shit like that? Yeah, those yeah. types of around the type. Yeah, yeah. and Rona Mitra was uh, uh, she was the female FBI agent that worked with um, dude from Ant Man. What's his name? Paul Rudd? No, uh, the, uh, the one who plays Luis. Oh yeah, I know. I know the guy from House of Cards. Uh, the I bald have, guy. Haven't seen no, no, like the one who does the narrating in the Ant Man movies. Oh, uh, Michael Pena. Thank you. Yes, uh, he was uh, the partner of Rodemitra's character in the movie Shooter with uh, Marky Mark. Oh, so she was in that. Uh, she was also in Underworld Three: Rise of the Lycans. And then she was in Doomsday, and she has not been in much else since. <laughs> uh, but Doomsday was it was it was a weird ass movie, and I own the DVD because I like that weird post apocalyptic tribal sort of cultist type shit. Yeah, yeah. Mad Maxi. Yeah, but uh, but this looks like that, but neon. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I'm very excited for Prisoners of the Ghost Land. I think it's going to be completely ridiculous. Like, and I really don't mean for this to like sound. Uh, to come off in a negative way, but like this movie looks like fucking like 2016 Suicide Squad puked all over it. You remember all the promos for that yeah, movie? Yeah. Just, just neon yeah. fucking everywhere. And it, it did not represent the tone of the no. film at all. No, no. Fuck that original Suicide Squad. Yeah, but also watch the Suicide Squad. Yeah, watch the though. new one. Oh the David Ayer God. Suicide Squad's garbage. I don't care if he has his own cut. It was also probably garbage. <laughs> now, well, th- that's the thing. I've seen a lot of people say uh, it, it's possible to think that David Ayer was genuinely screwed over by big business of Hollywood, but it's also possible to think that he's just kind of a hack. Yeah. Like, are you telling me that more Jared Leto Joker is going to fix your movie? No, fuck you. No, yeah. We needed less of that bullshit. Less, 
less I tell you. And more of John Cena in his whitey tidies. Yeah, no, watch the new Suicide Squad. <laughs> Fucking Go see Starro. John Cena's fat cock. God. Fucking Starro the Conqueror. I feel okay, like... That's, that's it. I feel like I'm going to watch that at least two more times before HBO Max pulls it. Yeah, I'm probably going to watch it uh, one night this week, watch it again. I fucking love that movie. I thought about doing it yesterday. It just didn't happen. Yeah, no, I was I was too exhausted. I was playing a lot of Cat Quest on my Switch. Fair. Oh, my God. It is a 2D open world RPG dungeon crawler with cats. Like the movie cats? No, not like that. Oh. Like cute, adorable little kittens that wear armor and carry swords and shit. So they're so, not Jellicle cats. So, so no. no Jason Derulo. But these cats have Magical bubbles. Mr. Mistopheles. <laughs> I don't know these words that they're speaking. <laughs> I don't under, I'm the only one in this room who hasn't seen cats. Yeah, that was something. That, 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 that. I'll watch it for a bit. Don't get me wrong. I'm not opposed to watch also be, it. <laughs> also, be sure to check out on the A Way C Eight side of things oh our unessential viewing of cats. Justice just is gonna be like, oh my god, I know we're watching Robert Birthday. Uh, no, Scratch um, a Dolph Lundgren. We're watching no, cats twelve I times. To tell you, there's totally a Dolph Lundgren cam. Oh, you're full of cats? shit. <laughs> nope, I'm wrong. We're Burgundy? watching Dolph no. Lundgren and cats. <laughs> No, we get into. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought it was Dolph. It's James Corden. I always get them confused. That's well. That's my. Bad. I feel like all the movies and things that we're gonna watch on that particular episode, the Dolph Lundgren, uh, Captain Shimmy birthday extravaganza. Yeah, we're gonna need a low point. So it's gonna be like the Dolph Lundgren, Captain Shimmy birthday extravaganza, and cats. Oh, don't worry. Master of the Universe is gonna be the low point. No, it's not. That's gonna be the best fucking movie we watch. <laughs> I will not hear otherwise. <laughs> Fuck off with that. Nonsense, Rocky Fork. Lick how my taint. D- how dare Lick you? my taint. How dare you? you? Stallone beats communism. You know yeah. what? You Rocky know what? Four, Masters, like Masters of the Universe is that simple ass burger that Rob makes, and fucking Rocky Four is that fucking fishbowl s- vape smoke bullshittery in this movie. How? <laughs> yeah, dare I said you. it. There, I said it. Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> Wait, we're watching a movie with Frank Langella <laughs> with bologna on his face. <laughs> oh, we gonna fight. <laughs> We all have us some throwing a hand. In case you haven't figured it out, I love Masters of the Universe. <laughs> but, uh, J- Jimmy gave it five stars. What are you talking about? Yeah, no, I love that movie. That doesn't mean it's good. I adore it's so it. So good though. It's a terrible movie that I love unabashedly. Oh, I can't wait. Fuck's sake, we just wait. did a John Claude Van Damme episode. The whole point of which was to get you guys to watch Street Fighter. I mean, yeah. and, and plus, like, th- there's definitely a conversation that I that I've seen ha- seen being had, and like one that is probably worth having is sort of while we're we're definitely in this climate of like t- taking away the like sort of f- pushing back its notion of like you know guilty pleasures, and I've seen people sort of doing a similar thing with like the 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 phrase "so bad it's good" or like "good bad movies." And basically, the the point of it is like if um if if there's a movie that you enjoy or something that like elicits some sort of positive regard inside of you then like it it by definition shouldn't be called bad yeah yeah e- like, even if it doesn't like meet these same sort of like critical marks as like a traditionally acclaimed film i've never liked the phrase guilty pleasure uh i think it's bullshit i first heard it when i was about 13 or so in a fucking youth group setting when one of the associate youth pastors who is an asshole I was like, I, I love how you like Harry Connick Jr., Justin. You just don't care. Like, it's your guilty pleasure, and you don't care who knows it. I'm like, yes, Grammy Award-winning Harry Connick Jr. Wait, what's wrong with listening to Harry Connick Jr.? This dude yeah. is just a prick. It's the like, sad you know, thing is, he was also a wrestling fan. Yeah. His, like, his license plate said it's true back then because he was an Angle fan. Yeah. But that was the only redeeming quality he had. Uh, but no, it was like that was my first reaction. It was like, you know what? Fuck you. Grammy Award winning 30 year jazz veteran Harry Connick Jr. is guilty. F- the fuck do you listen to, motherfucker? Yeah. And the answer to that was like country music. So, uh, yeah. again, like again, I don't like the term guilty pleasure, but some stuff sucks. Yes. Like Suicide Squad 2016 sucks. Sucks. Uh, country music, for the most part, sucks. sucks. At least modern country music. I'm not going to begrudge somebody for listening to it, but do not ask me to listen to it. Yeah. Because I hate it. Like I'm gonna pull a a uh, Nicholas Cage in this movie and just turn off your radio even if you're driving. <laughs> he did that twice. twice. It was great. Uh, which is another little bit at the end of the movie with um, 
with Amir's character, how like he gets in his car to like yeah, it's kind of like he's just sort of unpacking everything that he just went through by association with this character, and the same like pretentious bullshit comes up on the radio, and he turns it off himself. Yeah, yeah. Character growth. It's great. Yeah. We call that development, everybody. <laughs> yeah, but like, <clears throat> aside from uh, Nicolas Cage's performance, which, God, it was fantastic. It's so good. I I don't think there was a bad performance in this movie. No, no, no I wasn't. did not see one at all. No, I, I thought everybody was, you know, was doing their part on their game. And one thing I remember reading the, when I looked in the pig a little bit is how Nicolas Cage said he doesn't have any intentions of rewatching this movie because of just a intensely emotional and vulnerable place he put himself through in order to make the film he thinks it'd just be too hard to watch himself on the outside go sort of like just knowing what he put himself through for to, in order to make it that's it, fair yeah, yeah like I, I will that. say as much as I enjoyed it it's going to be a while before I can watch this again and do you want to know what I think this might be our highest rated movie in terms of like overall what? aggregate yeah Probably, I think I think it has beat because if I'm doing some quick math, but so forgive me if I'm completely fucking wrong because it's been a long weekend and I'm exhausted. But I think Lord of War was number one before because <gasps> that was that was two four stars and two five stars, and then uh, Raising Arizona was uh, like near there. So was Con Air. But like th- this might be, it might be our best, but it also might be tied. Yeah. Well, well, I'll definitely consult the official KG Greatness Excel sheet with all of our other <laughs> scores on it. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, like usually, like there's going to be one of us who's a Debbie Downer. Yeah. With a lot of these, but I think we're all pretty much on the same yeah. page. Like, like to to my point earlier, like when I saw the initial trailers for this and hearing all the hype, I was just ready to be like completely let down. Cause there have been like, like several, like there have been several movies to like, cause you know, that, I don't feel the same way now, but for instance, when I first watched mom and dad, sure. Like I really dug the trailers. And then when I watched the movie the first time, I really didn't enjoy it that much, yeah. but you know, I, that's won me over. Right. Uh, like, let's say the first time we watched Mandy, I didn't really enjoy that movie up until the end. And, and like the trailer, like sold me on, it. I was ready to go. I was, yeah. Kind of half ass anticipating being let down with this movie. I am, I have never been more happy to be wrong. Now, granted, uh, there, there there could be a little bit of like, I guess, like reason for that. Cause I know in a lot of some versions of the trailer, they did cut it to make it seem like a more John Wicky type film. Yeah. So, like, yeah. When, when you're kind of like, there's some, might be some people just like, I was expecting like, uh, Nicholas Cage comes in and just start whooping ass for like ninety minutes, and it's like it's obviously more like contemplative, emotional film. And people be like, bit bad, I might see that be caught off guard and still go with it. Whereas others might see that initial trailer or one version of that trailer be so like, this isn't what I thought it would be. And that's sort of like how manipulative editing can be. And sort yeah. of in order to put butts in seats, kind of like when we saw the green knight the green knight was cut more in a more cinematic blockbuster style the green knight's definitely more of a that, that is a art movie that is a very you know like an art con- house movie. A, a plaintive contemplative film that's and not really action something like that one it, for people like us who have watched a lot of movies like i know i saw through that first trailer's bullshit immediately oh yeah like sure it looks actiony but i'm betting like this is this is part like out of the 20 minutes of action and then a whole bunch of talking and walking and cinematography I haven't seen it yet, so I'm pleased to know that I was right. I, I but that would just I make me want to watch it. it more. Yeah, well, and, and like I, that's one of the main reasons I've kind of stopped watching trailers. For one, they they spoil movies yes. too much. Yes. They, they give away too much. They, they give away too much to where, like, even if they don't like outright spoil plot points, they give you enough information to where you go in. It's like okay, you can put the pieces together. Uh, and I, you know, most movies don't want to go in fresh. Mm. Uh, but also, too, like, a, and A24 is really bad about that, where they, uh, you know, they'll, they'll try to promote their movie a certain way, you know, to get butts in seats. And it's definitely more art housey, which, you know, the general public aren't necessarily going to be down for. And, and I get, like, from a marketing ex- perspective you have to do that to a certain extent 
and especially like right now where people are like desperate to want people to come to the movie theater so like yeah people want to see like kind of escapist and action movies so like when you cut everything to seem more action than than like when it's not really that there might be a bit of a pushback there yeah because I, I mean it's like you, you, if you cut like say like a movie like the witch or the lighthouse or whatever <laughs> for like a uh, you, you, you know most people like if you're going to cut that for what those movies are you, you know <laughs> Not many people are probably going to see them because it's very niche. Well, there's a whole YouTube channel called Editing is Everything that mm-hmm. does that. Like It takes uh, just any random movie and edits it to make it look like nine different genres. Because with little music and just cherry-picking your scenes from stuff, you can make anything look like anything else. Yeah, That is very true. But the point of all that was... Which is why we should, uh, in some regards, uh, give editors... A much bigger cut of the pie because they do a lot of hard work. Well, and and they have a lot more creative power than people think. Too. Yeah. Well, the main takeaway for me is that everyone should go watch James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. <laughs> yeah, on that, that is very Max true. Currently, because Starro the Conqueror. <laughs> yeah. Now yeah. that's a trailer where it's like I know exactly what I'm getting, and you know I'm okay with. I'm it. okay yeah. with it. <laughs> now, I, now I would love to see. The Suicide Squad cut as an artistic A twenty four neon type movie. Oh, that, that would be, be fucking funny. funny. I, I will say to your uh, uh, to what we were talking about trailers earlier. The way that came off, I was almost half ass expecting uh, Starro to be like the opening act of that movie. Which also, in turn, again, like that was a trailer that told me I think I might need to stop watching movie trailers. Yeah, you, the the trailer that when I really should have stopped. Uh, Every, everyone's feelings on this movie aside, the fucking trailer to Batman versus Superman tells you what's going to happen in that movie, beginning, middle, and goddamn end. Mm-hmm. Every bit of that trailer. And I was so mad after watching that trailer. And I was just like, I know everything now. It's this like, is dumb. It's, <laughs> like, it's like, what's the fucking point? Yeah. Which well, I, I mean, felt like that after the movie. <laughs> well, and, and then, like, after the movie, you're like, well, God, what was the fucking Fuck point? You, Still Zach not as Snyder. bad as Justice League. Just want to say no. it. Well, the, the original. Yes, I did sit through the four hours. I still love the fact that I sat through all four hours of that. You popped up in the two-hour mark, I believe. Yeah, you, sh- Jonathan, showed up at the like the last hour of the movie, and <laughs> Pat's like, "Fuck it, I'm here now." And then Jonathan sits down, and is like, "All right, well, I'm here at the good stuff. Let's go." <laughs> and honestly, I don't have to see anything else from that movie. I yeah. refuse to sit there and give that man four more hours of my time. That's fine. That's what I'm yeah. here for. No. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's I having not seen the original. I, you know, I think it the new one is fine. It's sufficient. I will say this: the first one. Um, I know this might be sounding harsh since we love the you know the five star scale here. Some of us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I I would give like no shit. I was fucking upset when I left the theater after Justice League. I give it half star on Letterbox. The the four hour Snyder cut bumps it up to a three. Yeah, I, I gave it. I. A nice jury. You know, no more, yeah. no, no less. less. I'm sure it's a better coherent film as far as films go. Yeah. I still hate it. <laughs> yeah. I, I do think it's set but, like a like a, a dangerous new precedent that we just, if people just act like the title Piss Babies and like Hollywood will cave to this demand. It's like, guess yeah. what? There's not, there's not going to be a more perfect, beautiful version that's, you know, that's, that's sitting in somebody's bunker somewhere. Sometimes you just get what you get. Well, and and like, you have to fucking live with it. I feel like that died down a bit, though, because then they moved on to, like, give us the air cut of Suicide Squad. And WB said no. And then everyone just sort of moved on. Because that's the thing is, that's all studios have to tell the audience is fucking no. It's like it's not because, good. Because, like, I get the point of this argument. It's like, well, the audience pays for it. You pays for your career, blah, blah, blah. At the same time, you are n- you are not an artist. You don't get to dictate their vision. Fuck you, you entitled But Jonathan, cunt. they bought their house. Fuck off. <laughs> Just a dirty quieter. Always quieting. All these people, like, quitting. And also, and it's a lot easier. House. It's a lot easier to fucking armchair direct, too. Like, movies uh, are really fucking hard to make. But also the Suicide Squad, it ruined Calendar, man. 
Oh, oh fuck. God. <laughs> damn it. The one calendar man stands. Oh, like, yeah. No, it ruined classic character, the calendar man, <laughs> by having him be shitty to another character for three goddamn seconds. <laughs> fuck you. I, I'm, I'm, fuck I'm, you. <laughs> but I hope that son of a bitch listens to this podcast, the guy who said that on the fucking Twitter. I hope you're listening, and I hope you fucking stub your toe every <laughs> night for the next 17 years when you get up to go pee. Fuck you. Yeah, yeah t- <laughs> dude, this, get this like random-ass character they made, uh, like in the 70s or whatever had like one story with pathos and that was it well just in case uh that uh particular person is listening to the podcast uh i just want you to know uh i i thought that part of the movie was really funny yeah go fuck yourself one guy on twitter (laughs) and also like i don't know did he ever look like that in the comics because i know that was like I know he looked like that in the Arkham games. Yeah, well, the, it, the that look came from, if I'm not mistaken, it came from Long Halloween. <gasps> You're right. I forgot yeah, about that. that. Cause that's like the only story where Calendar Man has like any substance. That and Dark Victory, which was the sequel to Long Halloween. Mm, yeah, so yeah. like... But that's fucking it. And, and the entire no. chronological... Well, well, time a hundred years of fucking Batman. Yeah. But I will say, if anybody out there is really, really bored and still has a copy of uh, Arkham City... I believe there's still an Easter egg where if you uh, check in uh, on certain holidays, Calendar Man has a, a special thing. message for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's pretty fun. Or if you're very fucking bored and have all the time in the world, just like change the day on your console and go check it out. Or if you don't have a lot of time in the world, just look for a YouTube compilation. That you know what? Works. Do that too in case also, you don't it, have the it, game. That and piss hate baby fun. Calendar Man <laughs> Stan is listening. I got two words for you. Suck it! He actually crotch chopped the microphone and almost fell out of the chair. (laughs) You know, it was worth it. He thrust his groin area into the microphone. I I just get really (laughs) aggravated when audiences are like, get super entitled like that. And and like, especially like even with like Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah. Sonic looks a lot better, but also too, like these animators are in sweatshops and you're bullying the studio to put these people in sweatshops longer. Fuck you. To be fair, that first design looked like a fucking... Oh, movie. it was awful. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I still would have watched a horror shows on it, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I kind of wanted to see that version. And, more. like, all the people who thought, oh, man, it was just a conspiracy. They had the real pretty Sonic looking ready to go the whole time. No, bitch. They had it. There's literally reams of toy catalog with the butt-ass ugly Sonic yeah. in it. I mean, they, <laughs> if they had it ready, it wouldn't have been delayed by six to eight months, however long it was. Yeah. Uh, also, for anyone who's a conspiracy theorist, get the he- get your head out of your ass and stop being fucking stupid. Yeah. Hashtag give us the butthole Sonic cut. <laughs> give us the butthole cut of cats. All right. I think that's an excellent place to end this review. Another of commercial. <laughs> heartfelt, deeply poignant room. Look, we thing. had to get some jokes out, okay? We all got emotional during this movie. Like this yeah. is the one this is the one time we were damn near silent the whole fucking movie. Yeah, just about. Just, just about. a little bit in the front and like a maybe a little bit in at the beginning. But I end. also feel like we were really pumped for this movie. And you know yeah. what? I I loved it. It was I great. did. All right, so um, Jonathan, start with you. Do the plugs. Where can the people find you? Well, they can find me on Twitter at J-O-N-I-A-B-Y-24 and John and Son 12 on Letterboxd. Yep. Patrick? Uh, this is Patrick. Thank you all for listening. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at John Lost His Name, or art on Facebook at John Lost His Name Art. And, and if you're listening to this on the day it comes out. <laughs> that's right. Ah! On the AYC8 side of things, on Monday... <laughs> August sixteenth, <laughs> we released episode two hundred and twenty-five. Y'all can hear podcast where we Ooh. had a, we had a rousing near two-hour discussion about our love of Japanese comic books, otherwise known as manga. And on Tuesday, wait, what? Uh, August the seventeenth, uh, our good friend Tanner released another episode of their late night talk show podcast where they discuss uh, just sort of general like good times and the world of wrestling from their pal in the wrestling Twitter scene who's a host of a wrestling podcast. Go check that out on Anchor. So that was about wrestling? Yes. Okay, just checking. Mm. Razzling. <laughs> I am that... <laughs> I have been that canon guy. You can find me at that canon guy on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. And Pat, I believe it's pronounced manga. 
It's mangers. Mang- <laughs> mangoes. Yeah, it's mangoes. They're delicious. They mangers and good. bash. <laughs> and I'm Captain Shimmy. You can find me at Captain Shimmy's Count Art, Captain Shimmy's Almost Music. Anywhere you find Captain Shimmy online, it's probably me or any variation. Except for that of. one guy on YouTube that's Except not for that you. one guy who's not me. Um, you can also find me at the comic strip. We just had our free comic day. It was exhausting, but it was great. And we're restocking stuff. So you'll come on by. And our next big thing is going to be October, I think, where we partner. Uh, it's our Wonder Woman Day where we partner with Turning Point. The domestic violence shelter, not the Nazis. We have to make sure to specify. The domestic shelter had the <laughs> name first. Thanks for pointing that out. Make well, sure well, 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 no, there, there is a group called Turning, Turning Point. Point. No, USA. no, I get it, but yeah. still, like, it's just, uh, <laughs> just like catch you off guard. Yeah. So uh, that'll be our next thing. We partner with the domestic violence charity, not the Nazis. We do not approve of Nazis at nope. the comic strip. You know what? Hot take: Nazis is bad. Yeah, that's not so fucking hot of a take anymore these days. Ever God, like, Bentley. what the fuck? This these past like five years have been fucking hell. Also, fuck Nazis in general, but also fuck Nazis for appropriating Nordic culture, metaphorically, not literally. Don't fuck Nazis, but fuck Nazis. No. <laughs> Because they do not need to reproduce. No. Anyway, uh, thank you all for joining us on this <laughs> ridiculous <Heartfelt> episode. <laughs> warm romp into the mystical world of pig. Uh, and, yeah, we're like uh, we're just full of our feelings, and then buttholes, and then, <laughs> and then this a nice little capper of fuck Nazis. Uh, all right, and a quick preview for what's coming up next, because I got to check the list. Oh yeah. Um, Looks like on our schedule next week is another episode of Travolting Development. Jesus, Titty fucking God, Christ! It's God, time again. The I feel like we Hang just on. did Wait, Michael. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, no. According to our schedule, next week is a bye week. God. Yeah, I, I, I'm about to say that because we had a bye week. Yeah, which so, we may take off or we might just put some bullshit in there. Yeah, we might spin the wheel again. We'll see how we feel. I mean, oh. Damn it. Quit throwing stuff. I dropped my cat. Also, that fucking cricket has moved six times during this episode. I don't think it's fucking dead. Ah! Ah! It's it's not not dead. What did I say? <laughs> oh my God. What did I say? It's this might be the last episode, everybody. Oh, it's going to jump on Pat and eat your face. Splat. Ah! Up. Oh, no. It's no! Oh, <laughs> jumping. God it's damn. missing a leg. It's missing a leg. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, it's still moving! How is this oh happening? My god, how is this still alive? <laughs> Die, you son of a bitch! Oh ah! Oh, bug murder! Oh my god. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I fucking killed it. <laughs> son of a bitch is dead. <laughs> We want to thank you all for listening to this episode of Cajun Greatness. And uh, if we don't see you next week for our bye week, we will see you the week after, uh, September 2nd, for Travolting Development. Oh, and yes. after that, it'll be my birthday pick, which will be a Dolph Lundgren retrospective. And I think that is uh, also... Yeah, there's two bye weeks there. So we might have two weeks off, or we might have two weeks of random bullshit. We'll see. So you're saying there's a possibility we might just say fuck it and spin the wheel next week. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I or, okay, do you want to spin it now just in case so we can at least prepare for something? You know what? Let's spin it now just yeah, in case. Just because we've got two bye weeks coming up. For instance, we don't want to be thrown B-movie spectacular yeah. like... Okay, like, right. what are we doing? Because <laughs> next week's a bye week, and then there's Travolta Development, and then there's another bye week, and then it's my birthday. Yeah. So one of those weeks, at least, we need to do something ridiculous. Well, I say, <laughs> since we're already doing it live with our emotions, let's just do it live with a with a wheel spin. Absolutely. Oh, here we All go. Right, John, go ahead. Do it. Now, that's right next to my so you know that's going to be popping. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, actually, that's about the same level as our voices, according to the EQ, and we have... <gasps> oh! oh no. Almost knocked the mic off. Oh, no, I can't see it. What did it land on? It, it almost hit Cannon's Choice, but instead oh, it landed on making Nick Cage themed restaurant. And that oh. is actually pretty perfect considering the movie we just You watched. know what? I don't hate it, even though it almost landed on my choice. Uh, and Ooh. tell you what, let's, let's go ahead and spin it for the other week just in case. That way we'll have two choices if we do have the two off weeks, and we'll see which one we feel okay. like next week. All right, let's or go the other can. way, Pat. All right, it's Pat starting to spin. All right. The fate of the next two uncaged episodes? Yeah. Could this be 
And if it lands on the restaurant thing, then we'll know God has told us what to do. J- John's choice. John's choice. Oh, fuck. I'll have to think on this. I think I know what we're going to do, and y'all are going to hate me. Okay. Fair enough. But we already ho- watched Hot Rod. No, I'm yeah, kidding. We can't watch it. <laughs> we're not watching Hot Rod. I know, again. I know, I know. We're, we're probably going to go to the other end of the spectrum. I don't like that. That has to mean the, the, the either few, David Lynch. I'm, there's a, th- there's or, a few things that might be. Uh, who's the other guy with the really thin mustache? John Waters. John yeah, Waters. that I guy. I reserve the right to refuse any of oh. those things. Y'all sound like some bitches. I'm not watching any more John Waters. Never again. Well, I mean, we've. we've <laughs> you can follow. You can watch our. Watch. Listen to our uh, John Waters episode on AYCH. Yeah, we did a John yeah, Waters retrospective. But yeah, we're not doing a John Waters. Okay. <laughs> so we'll. Uh, yeah, we will get with you guys. And we might have two weeks of Uncaged. We might have a week off and a week on. We might have two weeks off. We're just going to see how we feel. Well, but, yeah, that's what we feel like. Fuck yeah. you. Yeah. But for sure, we will see you back in, uh, in two weeks from the day you're listening to this, if you listen to the day it comes out, for Travolting Development. Thank you yeah. all for listening. Go watch Pig and watch The Suicide Squad and fuck Nazis, metaphorically. I, I, I After that cricket situation, I may or may not have shooted. I told you guys it was fucking alive. It's just been sitting I there the whole time. I thought it was time. dead. I had no it idea. It looked fucking dead. Except it kept fucking moving. From this angle, it looked like it was on its back, but I never saw it move. I wasn't paying attention, so. I never saw it move. I kept looking down. It was in a different spot, like the fucking weeping angel. Well, now it's in pieces. Who. That first strike, by the way, I saw one of its legs. It's right under Pat right now. It was Fantastic. hopping around with one leg. And uh, be sure to join us uh, next time to see what bug attacks us. More bug murder on the yeah. podcast. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, for real. We're leaving now. Thank you all. <laughs> Good night, uh, Babs. Goodbye. Good night, Babs. How absurd. Why couldn't you put the bunny back in the box? How absurd. I'm going to steal the Declaration of Independence.